Welcome to our lesson on the muscular system. So we're going to be looking at the chronic or long-term physiological adaptations to exercise, but focusing today on the muscular system. We're going to look at several things. We're going to look at hypertrophy, increase in tendon strength, increase in myoglobin stores, increased number and size of mitochondria, increased storage of glycogen and increased storage of fat, increased mu muscle strength and increased tolerance to lactate. So let's get started. Hypertrophy. You may have heard it um, pronounced hypertrophy, either is absolutely fine. Um, but essentially hypertrophy is uh, simply the increase in the size of muscle cells. So overall therefore uh, the size of the whole muscle uh, will get bigger. So muscle size in hypertrophy increases not just because we've got more muscle fibres, but actually because the fibres that are already there get larger. So the cells, the muscle fibre cells themselves, get wider, they fill up, if you like, and get larger. That is hypertrophy. There is some suggestion that there might be uh, another thing at work in giving overall muscle size, and that is called hyperplasia. Um, and we believe that it's growth hormone, human growth hormone, that stimulates hyperplasia. And hyperplasia is simply an increase, not in the size of the cell, but increase in the numbers of muscle cells. So when new muscle cells are being um, grown, that is called hyperplasia. Um, there is some debate about how much this affects muscle size overall and to what extent it can be developed and uh, through exercise and we, we think these days probably accounts for very little maybe about five percent of overall muscle growth. The next heading is the increase in tendon strength and as we know tendons will link muscle to bone, so they're different from ligaments in that ligaments are bone to bone connections. So a tendon um, will link muscle to bone so that when a muscle contracts, it exerts a force, a pulling force on the bone, and then it moves whatever joint it is or um, that it is connected to. So tendon is made out of collagen, uh, which is found uh, a great deal in the body, it's very strong, um, it's somewhat elastic. Um, but particularly strong and therefore it's a very good way of attaching the muscle to the bone to ensure that when the muscle does contract the tendon doesn't tear and we actually do get the movement we're looking for. So the tendons are made from collagen and essentially the, the sheath of the muscle runs into the tendon and becomes part of the sheath that surrounds the tendon itself. The tendon attaches onto the bone and it's there that the uh, force of the contracting muscle will pull on the bone and create movement in the joint. If we want to strengthen the tendon, um, we find that the best way to do that is to do resistance training. So that's using relatively heavy weights uh, to move the muscle um, and therefore having the knock-on effect of strengthening the tendon. A couple of things that do happen when the tendon strengthens are that first of all, individual collagen fibers will increase in thickness. And secondly, the number of collagen fibers and the, therefore the overall density of the tendon, uh, both will also increase as a result of resistance training. The increase in myoglobin stores is also a key way in which we can improve our overall uh, levels, particularly of cardiovascular fitness. It's a long-term impact of exercise. We've talked previously about what myoglobin actually is, um, and essentially it's a, it's a compound which is very similar, it's a protein that is very similar to hemoglobin, which we know, of course, uh, is found in the bloodstream. Myoglobin, however, is predominantly found in the muscle tissue. Um, and its purpose is there to bind, similar to hemoglobin, its purpose is to bind with oxygen and store that oxygen locally in the muscle cells so that therefore there is plentiful oxygen available for production of energy within the muscle cell. A 
occasionally we might find myoglobin in the bloodstream and this can be an indication that something has gone wrong. Um, if there is myoglobin in the bloodstream where it's not intended to be there is a suggestion therefore that the muscle has begun to break down. Occasionally this can occur uh, if there is extremely high intensity exercise over a sustained period of time and certain sports and physical activities are associated with that kind of very high level of exertion and one of the key indicators of damage to the muscle tissue is that we might find myoglobin in the bloodstream where it would not normally be found. So mitochondria are organelles, so very small and very tiny, located within cells themselves. They are organelles designed for cellular respiration. That means that they are the place where energy is produced for movement. So as far as we're concerned, if we have um, a larger number of mitochondria, and if we have an increased size of mitochondria, we are able therefore to use various different compounds within the body, including oxygen and pyruvate, which we've talked about previously, to create energy and resynthesize adenosine triphosphate, that's ATP. We've talked about the importance of ATP previously. Uh, it is the crucial um, compound in the cell that must be present in order for energy to be provided for the working muscles. Without ATP, there's no movement. And without mitochondria, there won't be any ATP resynthesis. So for that reason, we often call mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. But what we're interested in today is the fact that through training, you can increase the number and the, num and the size of the mitochondria that are in the cell. And obviously, therefore, an increase total amount of work being done by mitochondria at any given time in your body means a greater level of metabolism, a greater amount of cellular respiration, a greater amount of ATP resynthesis. And that's the key benefit um, of increasing the number and size of mitochondria through training. As you know, the human body is able to use um, carbohydrate, it's able to use fat, and in extreme situations, it's also able to use protein in order to supply energy to move, to sustain life, uh, and even to exercise. Our body would prefer not to use protein, um, that is the last on the list. So therefore, we, we tend to use a mixture at any given time, a mixture of our carbohydrate stores um, typically stored in the form of glycogen and we use our fat stores as well um, and both of those uh, are there they're available as fuel for exercise fuel for movement fuel for the cells which we've just thought about training however um, can benefit us in two ways firstly that we can actually increase the storage of glycogen uh, particularly glycogen stored in the muscle, which we would refer to simply as muscle glycogen. We are, through careful training and careful dietary manipulation, able to increase the storage of glycogen within our muscles. Two key things that we can do to make that happen is once we've exercised and used up a good amount of the glycogen that is stored in our muscles, within about a window of about two hours after completing that exercise, we should consume some carbohydrate. And in doing so, that carbohydrate will be drawn to the muscle and stored there um, in increasing amounts prior than prior to the exercise um, so that the body is then ready to complete that kind of exercise again. So the body is adapting to be able to, to meet the demands of whatever exercise we are, uh, we are placing it in. A second thing we can do to improve that system is to add a little bit of caffeine. It's been shown that a little bit of caffeine um, after exercise can improve the glycogen storage um, compared to not ingesting any caffeine at all. In terms of increased storage of fat, um, obviously we do need fat as a fuel. It's a, a very 
useful fuel because there's so much energy contained um, in a given density of fat. Um, but in terms of its storage, we don't want to store too much uh, fat on our body as we then tend towards obesity. However, we have some suggestion that as a result of training, additional fat in the form of triglycerides um, possibly are present in the muscle and therefore after a, a long-term training there's more of this fat available and present in the muscle so that it can be more easily oxidized that is broken down and used as energy where maybe the glycogen stores have started to be depleted or start to run out we might be able to then to move across to use the fat that's already there and present in the muscle and that is known as intramuscular triglyceride so intramuscular triglyceride is the fat that's stored within the muscle and it is possible it is suggested at least that as a result of endurance training or long-term training uh, over a long period of time that the amount of fat in the muscle uh, is increased muscle strength is another thing which increases as a result of chronic exercise particularly if we're doing resistance uh, weight bearing type exercise um, initially however that strength the ability to lift a greater amount of weight or a heavier weight or a bigger set of dumbbells or whatever it might be initially for the first sort of about six weeks or so uh, those gains in being able to move that bigger weight those gains in strength are essentially down to better neurological pathways and that simply means that the brain is getting better at telling the body what to do the brain is getting better at recruiting muscle fibers and using those muscle fibers to move the weights and it might also be a little bit to do with the movement patterns that uh, are set in the body so we do see improvements in strength fairly quickly um, without an necessarily seeing an increase in hypertrophy or what we might call true strength gains. That is, without the muscle itself getting any larger. However, after those first few weeks, uh, we do then see uh, a, a steady increase in the strength of the muscle, provided that the training is progressed appropriately and, it, and is, uh, is continuing. Muscle strength is also lost very quickly. Um, and we potentially can lose um, after about eight weeks of not training uh, we can lose around about 10% of muscle strength um, at the same period of time we might find that muscular endurance um, is much more quickly lost so even as much as 40% of our muscular endurance can be lost within a similar period of time within about eight weeks without training Finally then we've got this idea that with exercise over a period of time, uh, given the right kind of exercise, we can improve our tolerance to lactate. Lactate is a substance that is produced as a result of exercise, as a result of um, anaerobic exercise, anaerobic respiration, and it is found both in the muscle tissue and then um, often finds its way into the bloodstream. It was previously thought that lactate and its associated acid, which is lactic acid, which you'll have heard of, um, it was previously thought that these would affect directly the muscle's ability to contract or affect the muscle's ability to maintain a force of contraction. But the jury's kind of still out on this and we are tending at the moment towards looking at lactate not as a negative byproduct. Um, and, and certainly not as a waste product of our anaerobic respiration, but actually it is a useful form of energy um, in both the muscle and in the bloodstream that can, provided there is oxygen present, can be broken down first to pyruvate, which we've talked about when we looked at energy systems, and then um, converted back into glucose, ready then for more um, more breakdown to provide energy and the resynthesis of ATP. So we'll stick with the heading for now, but it is slightly more subtle than the idea that we increase our tolerance to lactate. Essentially that lactate becomes useful to us because we're able to supply the oxygen that breaks it down and makes it back into a useful substance, that glucose that's so important um, for creating 
um, energy for movement. So thanks for uh, sticking with it. Thanks for listening through. We've looked at these various different things. We've looked at hypertrophy, increasing tendon strength, increasing myoglobin stores, increased number and size of mitochondria, storage of glycogen and fat, increased muscle strength, and we've just done increased tolerance to lactate. Now, all of these things, of course, are chronic, which means long-term physiological adaptations to exercise. We haven't really gone into detail as to which kinds of exercise produce which kinds of adaptations, um, but we'll do that another time. But these are just a general generic list of some chronic adaptations that we can see as a result of exercise. Thanks very much.